I have over the years listened to many introductions of myself where people describe me as a lifelong Prince George, you know, and which is almost true. I'm, I'm told that I was born in New York City, I, I think in the Bronx, and that uh, my parents brought brought me uh, down here when I was 10 or 11 months old. I remember attending Fairmont Heights Elementary School, um, um, and then I attended Beaver Heights Elementary School, which was part of a natural progression of, um, I think, a new school scenario that um, was developing in you know, the segregated school system. And we had to walk about a mile or so to get our kids up to uh, Beaver Heights a Elementary. And while we could look across the railroad track and see the Chevrolet Elementary School. So consequently, we decided to get into the Let's break it open. And then from um, Beaver Heights Elementary School to Chevrolet Tuxedo Elementary School, which was anything but a normal progression, um, that was the result of um, some initiative, um, if not aggression, that my parents and others in the neighborhood undertook when we were kids. All the meetings at that time were in our living room. Okay. And, and I think Mrs. Curry took the notes and uh, Every, the few that were there, most people were involved, yeah. but they met in our living room. It wasn't by choice, it's just that he was a liaison person to the council. For me, it was personal. I felt like, you know, they're entitled to it. They live there. That school was closer. Um, I knew it was going to be a battle, mm -hmm. but it was worth it to me. Out of the eight families involved in that situation, the Currys were the only, was the only family to hang right in there till the courts decided. Chevrolet was one of those communities that um, literally at the time was set, split by railroad tracks. Um, the side of the tracks that we lived on was mostly black. There were one or two white families in the community on our side. You cross the railroad tracks to the other side of Chevrolet where, to my recollection, there were no minority families. It was the white side of the tracks. And the two communities pretty much got along until the issue of integration came up. When Dad first broached the subject of us going to Chevrolet Tuxedo Elementary School. He explained to us the way things were going to be based on um, the general mood of Negroes, African Americans, blacks, whatever you want to call us mm -hmm. at the time, which was that we were not to indulge ourselves in any violence. We were going to be going to this new school and that um, because of the effort to integrate, we had to accept that we might be subjected to conduct that we weren't entirely used to and that we could not respond to it. There was always concern about what would happen to them, but that bull was more concerned about that because Wayne and his older brother were the guinea pigs. As, as far as I know, they, they were the first and first blacks in the Chevrolet tuxedo at that time. I do remember a particularly tough time you had in middle school. I don't think that our uh, head uh, principal appreciated the fact we were integrated. Right. And a lot of kids who may not have befriended Wayne felt that he was being treated unfairly and they took a lot of flack because they wouldn't do things that they were asked to do by the administration. It's, it's been an interesting demarcation ever since I measure uh, a lot of things in, in my own life from 
that period of dramatic change. Where we were, it was changing to become predominantly black in that fourth ward that was separated from the rest of the town. And um, we didn't have many incidents, but we had a few. We had a cross burned on the yard and that type of thing. Once we left uh, our part of Chevrolet proper, there were no sidewalks. You walked along the side of the road till you crossed the railroad tracks and then there were sidewalks again because it was farmland. It was uh, industrial park land. It was interesting to have to walk from our side of the tracks, you know, over the bridge to the other side and um, to attend school. We couldn't get a bus because we were one-tenth of a mile short of the, the um, uh, criteria for getting a bus. So we had to walk to school. But when we first started integrating the school, I was fifth grade, Wayne was fourth. At some point, because of people just driving by on the old country road, giving us the business, the um, um, black uh, community on our side of the tracks got together and decided to ask for uh, an escort from the Prince George's County Police Department. And for a couple of days, the way they escorted us home was we walked in the street, there were no sidewalks, and the county police car bumped us behind the legs as the two of us walked home until we got to the area where the sidewalk started, which was also in the community where we lived, the area of Chevrolet where we lived. And that continued until one of the neighbors drove by one day and saw the police officers in, the, in one of their squad cars bumping us behind the legs as we walked home. And then the community decided to, dis, to ask the police to no longer escort us. And then when it came to um, Daryl leaving Cheverly to go uh, to Bladensburg, then he really got sticky because when they did the visits like they do, they left Daryl at school. I don't even remember how I found out that he didn't go. I think he may have told me when he came home that he wasn't allowed to go with his class to Bladensburg. I remember going to Bladensburg and sitting there, and first of all, making a noise because they didn't take him on the field trip. And then when school opened, went to Bladensburg and sat all day until they placed him. And there were many, many phone calls from the office, you know, to the Board of Education. Bladensburg Junior High, which was the feeder school for those of us from Chevrolet, was an entirely different composite of people, um, um, guys that combed their hair with their little thing in the front and pointed toe shoes uh, and uh, a lot of conversation about pool halls and other sort of things. I mean, it was a much more eclectic mix of, of students, which meant a much more eclectic mix of backgrounds. Although we were the other side of the tracks as to Chevrolet and where Joan lived and all these college-bound kids were living, um, by the time we got to Bladensburg Junior High, it was a whole bunch of blue collar um, kids and, and who weren't necessarily headed for college. Um, um, it was an entirely different experience, you know, in, encountering those guys with the pointed shoes or the ducktail haircuts. That was a little different experience for all of us. So we were together on the wrong side of the tracks as to those guys. I, uh, but by then you've also learned that the boogeyman doesn't exist and generally speaking have overcome your fear of white folks, you know, and are, at least in our case, which was a lot of problem solving, learning the benefits of being in this sort of bicultural situation because you're picking up a lot of things from school and enduring a lot of things as well, but picking up a bunch of things that are advantageous. And then at home in the evening, you're back in your regular segregated community with, with um, people who are enjoying a different experience entirely. Um, and 
at least in my own case, wondering what socially is next. I had um, decided that I wanted to be president of the ninth grade class. And of course, you know, we're in a school with 12 black people and with, as I said, these guys that wore pointed shoes. And so I was like, how are you going to do that? And so I was like, at the time, the administration allowed ninth graders, the leaving class, to actually vote for the incoming ninth grader to be president of that ninth grade class, along with the people who would be ninth graders that year. I was a ninth grader at the school when he ran a year behind me for class president. And uh, I was reasonably popular by this time. Wayne was in a whole nother category, but I had a, a core of friends Many, most of whom were white. I mean, we went to school with white children, so most of our acquaintances and friends were white. Mm -hmm. And by this time, the kids had started to accept other kids, most of them. So I was able to go around to the ninth graders and convince them, persuade them, that since we were leaving, it didn't really matter who the school president was. And had gotten assurances from most of the ninth grade that they were going to vote for Wayne as a lark. I uh, recruited several of the outgoing ninth graders, and um, there was one among them who was a huge cartoonist. I mean, this guy was talented. And so we made all these posters that said, vote for the man with the Florida tan, and we strung them up all over, all over the school. And the principal was, he was hot. I mean, he was just, and of course, the outgoing ninth graders never missed an opportunity to discuss that with the principal and the vice principals exactly what they were doing. Because we weren't going to be there. And again, leave it to the other side to convince you that they'll do whatever's necessary. Um, the school decided that ninth graders couldn't vote for the first time in the history of Bladensburg Junior High for the selection of the next year's uh, school president. And then uh, the school had uh, the vice principal and I believe the other candidate, someone associated with the other candidate, count the votes. And Wayne lost by one vote. It became part of um of uh, understanding the po you know how politics works, mm -hmm. you can't let your opponent count the votes. You know <laughs> <laughs> things don't have a way of not working out when that happens. Yeah. Over that time, in the ensuing feeding to Bladensburg High School, um, the sort of um, expansion of this bicultural thing, where which turns out to be a huge advantage when when you're competing, because you you you've already thought about lots of things that you're competitor has not, and it turns out to be a huge advantage. Um, so by the time I was at Bladensburg High School, I was already a fairly refined politico already, although I wouldn't have been able to name it then. Um, the sort of fun of the competition, the figuring out how to win um, things um, was already, had already begun by the time I was a senior. You know, we ran a slate at the high school um, much as we had, you know, sort of done things at the junior high with new people. And um, three of the four of us on our slate won officers, senior officers. And it was Wayne uh, and Joan and myself and John McDonough, who is now the Secretary of State for the state of Maryland. And he's only got it lost. You know, it's, it's just something that's been abiding ever since. Make the rules, win the game. He started with the expectation they figured all of us would wind up in college. Um, for my part, I, I um, sort of took it for granted as something that I'd want to do because it fit neatly into the whole notion of make the rules, win the game. Um, and, and that's been a theme over time as I've watched how people do things. And, and most of it I've picked up from this exposure in, um, you know, some of these unprecedented um, um, opportunities that, that I've had that have come up that I didn't expect and, and, uh, and, and the things that oriented me to do stuff that I wasn't even aware of then or things that then were painful 
um, that I literally blacked out that turned later out to have been very important things for subsequent engagements. Some of the, the stuff that you couldn't figure out in elementary school, um, you know, sneaking around, standing at the, the fence at the swimming pool that you couldn't get into because it was segregated. You know, you'd creep up there at night and grab onto the chain link and watch everybody else have fun and figure out how you're going to deal with that. Well, decades later, you know, we're negotiating with the Redskins, um, among other things, what the Sports and Learning Center is going to look like. And um, I just thought it'd be great if we had an Olympic pool for the community. And so we got an Olympic pool for the community. Our parents, I think, are the ones that kind of gave us a, you know, a, a software to say, look, you got to be able to act a certain way and, and treat folks a certain way. And I think that's what kind of carries you over. You know, they had never been taught that they were less than anybody else. And we, neither had we taught them, you know, any bias that we knew of. We couldn't, I look at myself and I look at these pictures and I said, we couldn't afford to. You know, we're the melting pot, so yeah. you just be who you are. There's always something about Prince George's County as a crucible, as a cauldron of progress that, that um, always was sort of calling me home. I uh, went to high school with a couple guys who had worked on the successful combatants campaign, and so I, I wound up uh, uh, on the county executive staff at Upper Marlboro, Winnie Kelly staff at Upper Marlboro. And that was another one of those Eureka experiences. Lo and behold, as if by magic, I got a job uh, in the county executive's office where, by magic, my buddies I'd been to high school worked. <laughs> and uh, so, um, anyway, I wound up in the county executive's office writing uh, replies to complaints of various kinds that people would have. Wayne came into my office after he'd been there for about a week or so. And he said, I just went to get lunch over at some, some place. Uh, he said, they, would, when, they wouldn't take my money. And he was all up and up and up and up and said, all right, yeah, Wayne, look, look, this is a strange town. It's a strange town. They wouldn't give me lunch when I showed up because I'm not some Sasser or Claggett or Channing or Booker or whatever the hell, the, you know, the, the landed gentry was. After a while, writing replies to general complaints, you start looking around going, who are these people? What do they do? Oh, well, those are the lawyers. Then I had the friends who had, who had worked were both in law school. And um, so I began to explore that as a possibility and why. Well, all these guys want to be in law school. And um, again, in the end, it, it sort of distilled down to make the rules win the game. And so you have to learn to make the rules, to accept the power, to not be intimidated by the contest and all of the discouraging things people will tell you. So I thought about going to law school. I was a little bit intimidated. I was like, you'll never make it. You won't pass the test. I'm telling myself all these horrifying things and had some friends saying, are you kidding? Just do it. And, and I began to, you know, I worked for the county during the day and, and attended law school at night and you know did four years of that and and um, the rest is sort of history but I'd already begun the, the political part by then. Dated back to his graduation or his last year of college, law school I believe it was, Wayne had gotten a Volkswagen and for a couple of years he had actually hitchhiked around the country. He had hitchhiked up to Connecticut to visit me when I was stationed there in the military. But he got this old Volkswagen. Little red Volkswagen and he took a cross country trip. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got out to Niagara Falls and he said he didn't wanna, he didn't wanna leave. He drove across country to see America himself. Begun my politics with the traditional guys, you know, and, and Winnie Kelly and Steny Hoyer and all those guys. And um, um, I had learned the business from my buddies who st 
stuck with it when I deviated and traveled around the country. They were here, can't made it. And uh, then I came back and, and got reacquainted with all of that. And, and I stuck with it that way, you know, just working on the campaigns we all worked on and were expected to work on in a sort of ticket machine slash jurisdiction until Jesse Jackson ran in 84. So in 84, um, me and a bunch of younger politicos decided we're back in Reverend Jackson. And by definition, that was, you know, uh, um, a declaration of war with the guys I'd been working with who thought it was the music at best, you know. And um, I don't know, for some reason or other, didn't, didn't think that we'd, you know, have much impact. As my political career unfolded, the, the, the guy that I thought would be the first black county executive elected to do something else. So we come to this 94 election and we got a great election. We've got a history of victories. Uh, we've got some unprecedented upsets. The numbers are all going our way and we don't have a candidate. You were talking about the possibility of all this. You were kind of whispering to me and I said, well, if you, you can't affect any change if you're not in office. So we sat and talked about that and said, okay, well, now what? And Wayne stepped up. It, it wasn't his plan initially, but he stepped up to run for it, and we started that one pretty early as well. That campaign, that election took place in 1994, and we started in 91. Um, you know, because it took a lot of effort and a lot of work to, to go for that. But it was, you know, it was another chance to sort of evaluate where we were and look at what would be good for the county and, and win, you know. Um, and so I think by most objective measures, it, you'd have to characterize it as as um, an upset. Taking the next step to run for county executive um, is really consistent with his track record from you know, growing up in Prince George's County and was illustrative of his care and concern for the county. For me, it was pretty consistent with something I'd come to expect all the way back to that vote for the man with the Florida tan thing, which was people underestimating what it is you were doing and in your own capacity to do it. And a core group of us, I think four or five of us, met in his basement and we're like, okay, this is the plan. And we're like, okay, we're all in. Once he said it, like, we're in. You know, roll up our sleeves, we're going for it. And we're going all the way. So when he won the election, and by this time he was a lawyer and he'd been working for some relatively important people, he was the man. I went to uh, Franklin Mint and got him a high-end little Volkswagen and gave it to him and with a note from his big brother saying, do not forget where you came from. Because it was clear that he was going to be rolling with the big dogs. And I never wanted him to forget that that's not where he came from. We came from a family that, by anyone's definition, that struggled to make ends meet. But our parents believed in something, which was the integration process, and subjected or injected us into that process. And I was, it was important to me that my brother not get so close to the flame that he burned himself. And he kept that uh, Volkswagen in his county executive office for both terms. Um, it was the kind of thing I hoped that as he made decisions, he would look at and realize that he needed to take a deep breath. The structural deficit and that kind of stuff, which ultimately, you know, required every bit of experience I'd ever had with anything on the bank board and public operations and the years with Winnie Kelly and the subsequent years helping other people get elected. Uh, the the bank board and and the controversies with various cases that that I had had when I was counsel um, um, at the hospital and some of the the big and controversial cases. By the time I was elected executive and discovered you know what I was going to have to do to to make the county healthy again, it was all of those experiences being summarized in 
God's sense of humor again. It's like I always had you because you go need every bit of this, you know, just to have any credibility at all. And um, and you may have won the election, but you're about to you're about to have to prove that that you can win um, the leadership challenge for for this community. He could go up to Wall Street without a script and razzle dazzle the rating agencies. Um, most of us have to be scripted to some extent, but he could razzle dazzle them and go to the um, International Conference of Shopping Centers, you know, every year and and just woo businesses. I mean, he has that innate ability um, to to analyze and communicate what our needs are and to put deals together that are beneficial for the residents of the county. In office less than a month and you know here's a, a troop of people coming in to introduce Jack Kent Cook to me who owned the Redskins and um, and who had an idea about wanting to put his stadium in Prince George's County. So we began that little bird dance um, about whether and how to get the FedEx field in Prince George's County. One thing he um, espoused is that he does not believe in giving away the store. He does not. And so, you know, some people think of a deal as a or public-private partnership as public-public. Um, and he's like, no, you have to bring something to the table. And it has to be worthwhile for the public. And he holds fast to that. He never wavers on that one. Uh, in the end, you know, we, we, uh, we, we achieved um, a really fantastic deal for Prince George's County. In fact, I contend the best stadium or arena deal in the country ever. And he made sure that there was a facility put in for the community because so many people were impacted by the stadium and construction of the stadium. And that sport and learning complex is high end. We put up zero dollars and get all of that stuff uh, out of it, scholarships, the uh, the um, the, uh, the initial um, financial um, seed for the sports and learning thing, which is literally a pre-Olympic center that n nobody else has mm -hmm. in the country. Um, scholarships at Bowie State and, um, you know, the foundation, the Learn Foundation and other things that, that were direct fruit of, of that deal. If you know him, he's a good guy. And he has a soft heart. He's a caring person, and that's why he's gotten into politics and done so much of what he's done. And I guess he got some of it instilled in him because it's a way of fighting back legally. I know a long time ago in one of the early interviews, somebody asked me a question in, uh, about how I felt, and I said that <laughs> it was sweet revenge <laughs> because you know, there were so many things that we couldn't do and that he couldn't do as a kid that he's made a difference with as an adult. And he's made it better for younger, more underprivileged children and adults as well. There's something awfully special about being part of a community that's one of a kind that went from being small, all white, and rural when I was a kid. And my recollection is during the 50s and 60s that maybe it was four to 10% African American and going up and down and back and forth at that time. But it was small, all white, and essentially rural. There were a lot of farms and stuff like that around Prince George's County. And it's changed now to a place where it's large by county standards, it's cosmopolitan, it's majority African-American, and the only example of that in the history of this country where income and education went up and not down. That's a huge and hugely special kind of um, emblem to wear as a community. It became a more level playing field and there was more opportunity. He didn't create an all black government but he did create opportunities where, to some extent, um, they didn't exist before that. To be able to scratch your initials on your hometown tree and watch it grow from that time in elementary school to the time where you essentially ran 
for the highest office and got it right off the break and were able to do good things without getting in trouble, without reinforcing stereotypes um, um, and, and taking all comers and, and enjoying it and not being intimidated by it. Um, yeah, there's a sacrifice, but it's part of what I hope my kids pick up, you know, out of the sacrifice um, is that none of it's easy. And so in terms of figuring out what you can do, who you can be, what your community is, and how you overcome problems, we've already demonstrated that there's a novelty here that, that through my life and career at least has always been special.